Well, hello and welcome to the Evergreen Building at the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls, Idaho. We're here in the geology classroom, uh, Evergreen A06, and uh, we're here with our next our next series in our Rocks with Wilsey video series. I apologize, I haven't put one together for, gosh, it's been maybe three weeks to a month. I had planned to do uh, something really awesome. Um, I had purchased a magnifier for my phone so that when we ran the video, uh, the hope was that I could zoom in on some of the sandstones and show you some of the fine details in the sand uh, that helps us differentiate different types of sandstone. Long story short, um, the magnifier did not work as I expected. I'll be sending it back. Uh, and so couldn't really find anything else. I'm sure there's probably something out there that would work, uh, but I really just wanted to get this video out there so we can move on to the next in the series. If, however, at some point someone lets me know or I find a better magnifier, um, I might redo this one. But I think I've got it put together where I can share some of the things I wanted to share about sandstones in particular with you, uh, showing you some of the detail you get with, with uh, my magnification um, and still not really jeopardize any of the content. We'll also be looking at shales and mudstones. And then in our next video series, um, we'll be looking at some of the, the biochemical sedimentary rocks, limestones, coal, chert, uh, and maybe a couple other rocks as well. So let's kind of uh, get down to the brass tacks here. I've got a bunch of things to share with you. Um, but as we normally do, let's start with, with some notes here. And I'll point out a few things as we go. Uh, and we'll see where this takes us. And hopefully this is helpful to you. Again, uh, the whole purpose of these videos is to help you with your own rock identification and um, the things that you're doing on your little adventures that might be helpful to you. So let me grab a little pointer here. So we're gonna be focusing on the clastic sedimentary rocks that involve the finer grain sizes. So we spent our last video looking at conglomerates and breaches. This time we'll look at the sand size uh, portion of grains and the sandstones, and then the mud size portions, which make shale and mudstone. So we're looking at dominantly these smaller size particles. Obviously, if the particles are smaller, the story then behind those rocks is that we're looking at environments, locations uh, where the energy level in the system is medium to low. So what I mean by that is we're looking at places where maybe the water or the wind is moving enough to move these small particles, but it's not moving enough to move the gravel sized particles. So these are gonna be a little bit more tranquil and less energetic environments. Uh, and we'll get to some specific environments as we go. Um, one way to distinguish between sand and mud as we look at different types of rocks, uh, even though they have a specific grain size down to like the millimeter or inch size, if you will, uh, a numeric number, uh, you can roughly tell the difference between the two by, by touch. And so sand is kind of gritty and rough as you touch it, whereas the muds, which remember include silts and clays, they'll tend to be a lot smoother to the touch. Uh, one fun fact I found out this week in kind of putting this together is that um, the, the, the line, the uh, actual number in terms of millimeters or inches that divide sand from mud sized particles uh, isn't so much arbitrary. It's actually pretty much the, the lower limit of what the human eye can see. So basically human eyes can see sand grains without any sort of magnification. But as you drop below that criteria and that um, boundary for sand down to mud, the particles become too small. And so we can't differentiate those. Um, a lot of times when you see these, all three of these rocks in an outcrop or in a road cut at a bigger scale than what I can share with you here in the laboratory, um, they'll show bedding. So they'll show layering in these rocks. These rocks are oftentimes layered um, maybe in tens of feet, maybe down to feet or meters, uh, and oftentimes even smaller than that. They can even be uh, bedded at such a fine scale that it's what we call laminated. And I have at least one or two sandstones here that are laminated that I can share with you. And in general, these are all great rocks to look for fossils in because we have a lower energy environment where um, the water or the wind or whatever it's transporting the sediment isn't uh, incredibly vigorous. This is a good environment for organisms that have hard parts, bones, shells, even plants sometimes to get preserved. And so these are great rocks to look for fossils 
uh, depending on their age. If you know the age of the rocks, that's helpful too, because that might help you key into certain fossils if you know a little bit about what, what kind of fossils were existing at, at different periods of time. So let's start into sandstone. And sandstone, you know, if you want to just stick with sandstone to sandstone, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Uh, but just like anything in life, you can, you can um, kind of focus in and get more detail and more description out of it if you so choose. So remember, sandstone encapsulates grain sizes that range from coarse to medium to fine, just like when you buy sandpaper, you can specify the grit or the size of the particles in the, um, in the sandpaper. So we, we, we recognize that sandstones um, aren't all the same grain size. There's a, there's a little bit of a variation there. Um, we're not gonna get too deep in the weeds with differentiating sandstones. There's some other names out there you might run into, uh, wackies, aronites, arcoses, lithic sandstones, um, so on and so forth. And really to identify sandstones at this level, you really have to be able to look at the individual sand grains and their composition. You need to be able to tell how much of my sandstone is composed of quartz, how much of it's feldspar, how much of it is some of these other materials here. And so you definitely need some sort of magnification. Uh, here at the college, we typically use some simple stereo microscopes. So if this sounds like something you're really interested in is looking at sand, and sandstones, um, you can get a, a stereo microscope for as cheap as maybe 150 bucks or so. They go up from there, but it's really just a, a, a really amazing little world of um, looking at sand grains, which are just basically tiny, tiny rock fragments or mineral fragments, uh, and being able to classify them. Let me let me pause there and kind of show you a little bit of what I mean here. What I what I did because I didn't I wasn't able to get the the magnification uh, on my phone to work with some of the actual samples is I went ahead and went to the internet and uh, just printed out some uh, micro photographs of different sandstones just to kind of give you the idea of what we're talking about here. So this is, fortunately there's not scale on this, but this is a sample of sand from Pebble Beach, uh, California. And so you can see there's like pieces of little rocks in here, maybe volcanic rocks. Uh, there's little chunks of quartz, uh, just all sorts of things in here. Pieces of probably quartzite, these kind of creamy looking ones here. So once you get some of those basic rock and mineral skills, you can use those as you look at your sands or sandstones to kind of see what little treasures are in there. So here's kind of a typical California sand. Um, here's what we would call a, a mature sand um, from a beach in Australia. A, a mature sand would be one where quartz dominates. Quartz is a tough mineral. Um, it's very stable chemically, but it also beats up a lot of the softer rocks in an environment. So whenever we get a sand or a sandstone that has, uh, is dominated by quartz, we often call that a mature sandstone. Also notice that all these little quartz grains in here are pretty well-rounded. Um, they're kind of sub-rounded to well-rounded in terms of their shape. So these have banged into other grains of probably quartz and chipped away the corners and the, 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 the angular spots to form these more rounded uh, pieces here. But this is what quartz looks like um, in sand size particles if you have enough magnification. So I just wanna share a couple of these with you and then we'll get back to the notes and then we'll look at uh, some other samples as well. Uh, this one didn't have a label, so I don't know where this one's from, uh, but this is what a typical uh, arcosic sand might look like. So you can see uh, there's there's quartz in here. Let me see. Uh, there's some quartz in here, but some of these reds and pinks are actually uh, feldspar minerals. So potassium feldspar uh, or other types of feldspars. And there might be some other stuff in here as well, some little rock chunks. But this will tend to make the overall rock a little bit more red in color. Uh, be careful though, because we can still get quartz rich sand that is red in color. And I'll explain that more when we get to some samples. So you can't necessarily judge the content of the sandstone by the overall color of the sandstone. But this is what some of the sand grains look like up close. Uh, and then just two more here. Um, this is from, I'm not sure where this one's from either, but this would be what you would see maybe in Florida or in the tropics. All these white chunks in here are actually pieces of shells and shell fragments, coral. Um, and so a lot of our white sand beaches in the tropics tend to be dominated by these more organic rich particles, um, mainly composed of calcite uh, in these environments. So these are all little shell fragments and pieces of shells. There's probably a little bit of quartz in there as well, but the organic material sort of dominates that one. 
And then this last one here, which maybe is my favorite because it's uh, I've been to this location and, and there's just so many varieties of sand uh, in this area in Hawaii. This is South Point Beach in Hawaii. And as you go to Hawaii, you'll see both, um, we can zoom in here a little bit, you'll see both uh, black sand from the basalt, the volcanic rocks, but you'll also see little bits of the, the organic material as well, the coral, shell fragments, that sort of thing. So this one's kind of a mixture of black and white and the color of the sand on the beach in Hawaii will be somewhat determined by um, you know how much you have of the basalt the volcanic rock versus the little organisms there the, the invertebrates the coral the clams uh, the shelly fragments there so hopefully that's helpful and maybe just as good as if I was able to figure out a, a system to to show you magnification of the samples I have but I wanted you to see how cool sand looks like when it's magnified and uh, I hope you're maybe a little bit tempted at this point to get yourself a stereo microscope and start exploring the the wonderful world of sand because it's really really pretty cool when you when you look at it um, okay continuing on so what else should we consider as we look at these sandstones you should think about what it's made out of you should think about the degree of rounding of the grains as you start to use your detective skills to figure out where it formed Obviously, if we're looking at an environment that causes more collisions between particles, that's gonna to tend to create more rounded particles overall. Um, the composition will always reflect the area that the sand is being derived from. So it could be up in the mountains if it's a river, it could be a nearby outcrop that's, uh, where the wind is blowing past it. So you can always look at the composition as a way to um, infer where these, where these sand grains might be coming from originally. Um, some of the minerals we've looked at in here, the mafic minerals, the dark colored silicate minerals like olivine, which is that kind of green one, amphibole pyroxene, these are minerals I've showcased in my mineral video series, uh, and plagioclase. These, these minerals tend to not show up in your sandstones because they break down pretty easily uh, chemically and they turn into clay sized particles and then they get blown away and deposited somewhere, or carried away and, and deposited somewhere else. So you don't tend to see these as much. Uh, in Hawaii, there is a green sand beach that's made out of olivine, um, but it's pretty rare because you just typically don't see uh, olivine uh, sticking around as sand sized particles for very long. And in the case of Hawaii, this is a very young deposit of olivine, so that's why it's, it's still there. Um, remember that the case bar and the micas, they tend to weather more slowly, so you do see them in sandstones. They'll, they'll show up in sandstones, but they're going to definitely be beat up uh, if, if the sediment's being transported farther, they're going to get beat up by the quartz. The quartz is just tough, and it's, it's going to tend to dominate as things get moved longer and further from their source. So as you prolong the transport uh, distance or time, uh, the quartz is going to tend to dominate. And that's why we talked about these things like um, uh, mature sandstones. So some typical environments where we might see sand dominating, I think these will all make sense for you. It's kind of like where you see sand in nature, uh, kind of loose sand on its own. It could be a beach uh, where the, the land meets the ocean and the wave action continuing to carry out the smaller particles and round and uh, mature those, uh, those sand sized particles. It could be a stream point bar of a stream, maybe the bed of the stream, could be an alluvial fan where a stream kind of um, flows out into a valley floor, could be a debris flow, which is kind of a, a, a very sediment rich, murky looking flash flood, I suppose. Um, and then I guess I got beach there twice, sorry. So there's a little typo there, but yeah, beach again. Um, beaches are definitely places where we see sand side particles. So let's go ahead and look at some samples. Um, I've got here, several different samples of sandstone. I've also got over here um, some bags of sand. We're not going to look at these, but I've started to, not seriously, but somewhat casually collect different sands from different locations. So I've got one here. There's some rocks in here too, but some black sand from Iceland. This is from the Bruno Sand Dunes in Idaho, kind of a black and white salt and pepper mixture of, uh, of sand. Uh, this is from the Bahamas that someone brought back for me that has a lot of the organisms and a lot of the shelly material. And this is from a drilling project I did. This is actually a rhyolite that was very kind of uh, uh, powdery uh, as it was being drilled. And so I kind of took a little sample of that. And so just fun things to do when you're, when you're bored is to look at your sand and 
look at it all under a microscope. So let's look at these a little bit one at a time. I'll, I'll zoom in the, the camera here as best I can so you can kind of see some of these things. So here we have a sandstone and maybe the first thing you kind of notice are some of these um, reflective particles in here. These are little bits of mica and anytime we see mica like muscovite in a sandstone that tells us that this sandstone and this sand was deposited fairly close to its source. These micas aren't super tough. They're chemically pretty stable, but mechanically they can get broken down. They can get beat up over time. Um, and so we wouldn't expect these to last very long being carried far from their source. So you're probably looking at a case where the uh, sandstone is probably within a few tens of miles of the rock in which it was derived. And usually when we see mica crystals here, we might be thinking about maybe a schist or a granite rocks that often host the mica crystals as well. Undoubtedly, if we looked at here uh, with a little bit more detail, it's probably got a lot of quartz in it as well and some feldspars in there. So, so there's one sandstone there. Um, this one is kind of a similar sort of thing with a maybe a little bit bigger grain size to it. So we can see these big uh, micas here on this bedding surface. If we rotate the rock sideways a bit uh, you kind of lose the the flash of light in the micas but you can see some of the some layering here in here so those micas are laying down uh, parallel to this this uh, this direction here uh, the bedding and so here's another sandstone again it's got quartz in here but the micas kind of catch your eye because they're a little bigger and those perfect cleavage planes reflect the light um, moving on because i got a lot of rocks here uh, kind of a similar one again. I think this is the last one I have with maybe appreciable uh, mica crystals in it. Uh, there's one here. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit more. Uh, if we look at the side, we can see there's some oxidation here. So this sandstone's got a little bit more browns and reds in it. So some iron oxidation uh, in it as well. You can actually see some of the, looks like that might be one of the mica crystals on the side there. Um, a little hard to tell. So another sandstone there, again, kind of gritty and rough to the touch. This is the Navajo sandstone from Southern Utah, kind of famous at Zion National Park and some other areas as well. We can see that this one's actually laminated. So you can see, here's a better side here, all the small and fine bedding planes. These are all less than about a centimeter or so. So we can see that it's nicely laminated. Uh, and believe it or not, I think we'd need a little bit more magnification to see the grains in here. The, the phone's just not zooming in quite enough. But I think uh, if we looked at these under a stereo microscope, you'd see that most of these grains are actually quartz. And the reddish color actually comes from the cement that surrounds each little grain and binds them together. And it's a mineral called hematite. So it's basically iron oxide. So the pretty red sandstones we see in Southern Utah, most of those are actually quartz rich sandstones. A lot of them are windblown from a, a sand dune deposit, but the pretty reds or pinks or oranges that we see, a lot of times it's the iron oxide that's cementing the little quartz grains, sand grains together that imparts the color. The quartz itself, as you've seen before, uh, with those photomicrographs is, is kind of colorless or maybe kind of whitish in color. Sometimes it can be kind of a pale pink, but generally it doesn't have much color. So the color in this rock actually comes a lot from uh, the, the iron oxides that's forming the cementing agent there. Same thing with this one. This one's just a little bit more speckled. So this one's um, kind of a freckled sandstone, um, but this would also be a quartz rich sandstone. And then we have these areas in here of iron oxidation uh, where we see some of the, the reds and such. Um, yeah, and again, trying to kind of straddle the line between, yeah, you can see if I hold this still, yeah, you can see some of the quartz grains in there. And then where it's red, you've just got a little bit more uh, iron oxidation. Similar thing here, just wanted to show you a little different color. So this one's a little more yellowish, this sandstone here. Um, sometimes these can develop, so we can see the primary bedding surfaces are here, but these develop as, as uh, groundwater moves through the sandstone, um, it can actually introduce iron oxides in this case, and it can actually stain across the bedding. Uh, and sometimes this stuff, if it gets really kind of colorful and pretty, sometimes it's called pitcher stone, and they sometimes quarry this out in big slabs, and it's used for 
decorative uh, rocks, landscaping, that sort of thing. But another kind of uh, quartz rich sandstone with iron oxide cement, similar to the last couple. One more, this is from, um, this is also essentially the Navajo sandstone. This is just called, over by Las Vegas, this is called the Aztec sandstone, but it's the exact same thing. Um, quartz rich for sure, um, but with some of these areas of iron oxidation, but you can see uh, that more typical quartz color in these areas here that aren't aren't as red. A um, couple more, another quartz rich one. This one's uh, kind of pink overall, um, but another quartz rich sand showing a little bit of iron oxidation and also the bedding and the layering in there as well. Uh, another quartz rich sandstone here. Um, this one, let's see if we can get this one yeah, there we go, that's not bad. Again, lots of quartz in there. Really nice laminations here as you look at it on the side, uh, the fine laminations as this was being deposited to just a few sand grain layers at a time, probably in a, a wind-blown sand dune environment. Uh, this one's a little more coarse grained. Um, there's also, I believe, yeah, there's some other things in here. This one probably has some lithic materials in here, some rock fragments in it as well. Let's see what it looks like on the side here. And can we zoom in a little bit more and keep it all going? Yeah, so this one undoubtedly is probably quartz rich, but I think I'm seeing, again, naked eye and with the camera on the phone, maybe possibly some feldspar fragments and some, some little rock fragments as well. And then my last sandstone to share with you here um, is this big sample here which is actually an oolitic sandstone. So these are actually um, pieces of, you can see these little kind of rounded uh, spheres in here. These are not quartz or anything we've talked about. These are actually little um, wave, so they've been pushed, the little pieces of calcium carbonate that kind of get rolled back and forth on a lake shore or near the ocean and they get successfully, successively coated with uh, little bits of calcium carbonate. And so these form these little rounded things here that we call um, ooids. And so just to demonstrate uh, the composition of this rock as being somewhat different from what we've seen before, uh, if we put a drop of hydrochloric acid on it, you can see it goes crazy because it's all made out of calcite. It's all calcium carbonate. And so we get that nice strong reaction there. So this would be an um, oolitic limestone. So if you need a fun Fun phrase for the day. Try to try to wow your friends with that little that little nugget. Um, okay, so let's wrap this up with our last um, little group of rock. We don't have as much detail uh, when we get to the mudstones and the shales. Remember, these are made out of much smaller particles. Even under a stereo microscope, you just can't see what the composition is very easily. It takes like a much higher powered microscope to be able to tell what what the composition is of the particles in there. But mud, remember, is clay and silt. Uh, yeah, we can't tell what it is with, with just a microscope. And the main way we distinguish between mudstone and shale is a shale will break along the bedding planes or the orientation of the, the, the clay minerals in there, and it'll form little chips, so flat kind of um, chip-like rocks, and kind of like this here, um, these kind of flat, Remember, shales and mudstones will be smooth to the touch. So you just kind of drag your finger or thumb across it. It'll feel kind of quite smooth to the touch because those grains are a lot smaller. Uh, and then last thing on the paper here is what are some environments where we see shale? Maybe it could be a floodplain of a river where we just have the fine uh, sediment that gets uh, deposited when the flood kind of stops moving, just the suspended material settling out. Could be a tidal flat along an ocean uh, where the wave action is not very strong and mainly it's influenced by the tides. If you've ever gone clamming, uh, you're kind of mucking in the mud there. So that would be a good environment for that. Could be shallow marine, like an offshore environment, maybe a few miles or tens of miles off the coast under the water where just the finest particles settle. Or it could be a lake. And so I don't have a ton of samples here uh, to share with you, but a couple we could kind of look at here. So again, uh, shales, which come in various colors. Um, a lot of people think that if a, if a rock looks like this, it's automatically a shale. Um, and the reality is you need to look at it. I've had people bring me flat rocks that were obviously volcanic. They had crystals in them. 
um, but they just happen to break because of the fracturing in the rock into these flat planes and chips. So the sh just because you have a, a sort of these flat little chips uh, in a rock or outcrop doesn't make it a shale. Uh, to be a true shale, it needs to be sedimentary, needs to be dominated by these mud-sized particles, um, and that's what'll make it a shale. So just a couple there, a couple different pieces to kind of showcase there. Um, mudstones will tend to be a little bit more blocky and massive. So as I rub this with my fingers, it's definitely smooth to the touch, but notice that the way this thing's breaking, it's more irregular. There's no kind of rhyme or reason to it. It's more blocky and irregular. Uh, here's another one here. This one's probably more properly called a clay stone because this is uh, exceptionally fine. You can kind of see some of the powdery residue coming off on my hand here. Uh, this is mostly clay sized particles, but we'd still, the way I've classified these anyway, we'd still be fine calling this a, a mudstone. Uh, and then the last thing I wanna share with you here uh, with respect to, I guess, fine sandstones and also shales or mudstones is these oftentimes have uh, these rippled surfaces in there, these ripple marks. This almost looks like a little washboard here, but you can see these ripples here, which are always a clue as to what kind of depositional environment we might have. Here's another version of the same thing. And so you can see these undulating ripples here that lets us know that whatever deposited this um, was perhaps moving water back and forth. If these things look symmetrical from the side, uh, and if we look at them, sorry team, if we look at the shape of these ripples on the side, you can hopefully see that they're pretty symmetrical. There's not like a steep side and a gentle side. So that suggests that the the depositional environment that deposited this rock and shaped these ripples on the surface had uh, some sort of mechanism where the water was moving back and forth. So it could have been a lake shore with sloshing water, could be a tidal flat where the tide comes in and the tide goes out, but it definitely would not be uh, a river where the current continues to move in one direction or the wind where we would expect the wind to be blowing in dominantly one direction or else we would get uh, asymmetric ripples as we look at it on the side. So, so hopefully that was helpful. Just uh, a little uh, getting back in the saddle here with this video series on sedimentary rocks and sandstone shales and mudstones. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, do all those great things. Happy to, uh, if, you're, if you'd like to send any sort of donation, there's donation links on the banner. Um, there's links under the video description of ways you can, you can donate to my channel and help me out. Uh, much appreciated if you can do that. Otherwise, uh, look for my next video in a week or two. Uh, and I think we'll definitely switch gears. We'll still be in the sedimentary rocks. We'll probably jump right in and deal with limestones to some degree. Um, probably not to uh, an advanced degree, but we'll look at several different types of limestones. They're pretty fascinating rock, totally made out of calcite. So we'll take it from there. So hopefully you enjoyed this kind of helter skelter, but somewhat hopefully educational approach to identifying sandstone, shales, and mudstones. Thanks so much for joining me.